My name is Jamie Goggins, and in this section, we're going to talk about the major construction materials that have the highest negative or positive environmental impacts during the building life cycle stages. Whole building life cycle analysis shows us that a building structure and substructure typically constitute the largest source of upfront embodied carbon, up to 80%, depending on the building type. However, because of the relatively rapid renovation of building interiors associated with tenancy and turnover, the total embodied carbon from interiors can account for a similar amount of emissions over the lifetime of a building. We focus primarily on, primarily on structural materials, metals, including steel and aluminium, cement, insulation and timber. Each of these materials has a different embodied carbon content, but it's critical to consider structural systems in this context. The figure shows the as usual building's components, such as the structure consists of beams, columns, floors and roofs. Then the building envelopes consists of insulation, metal panels, glass, aluminium mullions and precast panels. Finally, the finishes that contained ceiling, tiles, gypsum board and carpeting. Building materials are a significant source of emissions. Carbon emissions released before a building up from carbon are of great concern as they are irrevocably released before construction. The building life cycle assessment results show concrete, steel, insulation and carpeting as materials with high environmental impact. The figure here shows the embodied carbon hotspots of a project as a bubble chart. The size of the bubble correlates with the climate impact related to each other. It is clear that cement and ready mixed concrete for structural elements like slabs, walls and so on are responsible for the most significant contribution in, car contribution in carbon emissions. Then the carpet floors, EPS, insulation, rebar, glass and bricks. The percentages can change depending on the, on the topology of the building. Another study demonstrated that the car embodied carbon of different construction materials varies significantly. The figure shows that material substitution can reduce embodied carbon. For example, aluminium has the highest impact if it is used as a primary production. However, it will be between the lowest if it is used as a recycled material. The figure presents data from the inventory of carbon and energy, also known as the ICE database, supplemented by data from academic articles. Such information should play an important role in the design stage and the selection of construction materials. The figure also confirms that recycling building materials can reduce embodied carbon. Also, all the examples show that primary materials embodied carbon is higher than their secondary equivalents. The figure also confirms that recycling building materials can reduce embodied carbon. All the examples show that primary materials embodied carbon is higher than their secondary equivalent. Let's talk about cement and concrete. Concrete is one of the most widely used materials in the construction industry and a primary source of embodied carbon in buildings. In fact, global use of concrete exceeds the consumption of any other material aside from water. Although each of the concrete's constitu constituent materials offers opportunities for reduction in body carbon, the high embodied carbon of concrete is primarily driven by the manufacture of one key ingredient, ordinary port and cement. Portland cement is the most common cementitious binder used in concrete mixes. In the concrete life cycle, as we see in this figure, cement is a major component and is the most significant carbon dioxide emissions contributor. 60% of the carbon dioxide emissions from cement production come from the chemical reaction, which is step two, to produce clinker, an intermediate uh, cement component. 40% of cement uh, production emissions come from burning fossil fuels. Step two here to heat the kilns required to produce clinker. These values can vary, depends on the manufacturing processes used and the primary uh, material used to heat the precalcinator and also the kiln. When specifying concrete in Europe, we need to follow the European standards, the EN standards. So, the standard for concrete specification in particular is EN 206 which has a suite of standards related to it, including the testing standard and the constituent standards. ISEN uh, 206 will be the Irish standard equivalent for the European norm 206, which applies to concrete for structures that are cast in situ, precast structures, and structural precast products for buildings and civil engineering structures. The standards that are applicable to concrete produced in the plant produced in ready-mix concrete 
or in, or in a plant for precast concrete products or for concrete mixed on site. Within the concrete mixed design, we have a choice between the cement type and the amount of cement to uh, use to meet the strength and durability requirements of the concrete. On this diagram here, we can see the uh, different choices available to us. So on the bottom left hand corner, you've got SIM1, which is effectively 95% ordinary Portland cement with an associated embodied carbon of about 760 kilograms of CO2e per tonne of uh, SIM1 produced. Uh, going up the uh, left hand side of the triangle means that we're increasing the amount of slag in there. So if we have 80% slag, for example, at a SIM uh, 3C or SIM 3B, uh, you have 120 kilograms of CO2 um, equivalent per tonne. And then if we come down on the bottom of the triangle, uh, we can um, use fly ash as a supplementary cementitious cement material, uh, and if we use say, 35 percent of uh, fly ash, we can get uh, SIM 2BV and get an embodied carbon of the cement of 600 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per tonne. So this diagram here shows us the different choices that we can make in terms of the cement and the cementitious, supplementary cementitious material combinations that we can use. Since the large quantities of relatively untreated aggregates used in concrete, the embodied carbon is relatively low if considered on a weight basis. Still, it becomes still impact becomes significant as it is used in large quantities. As a low embodied carbon concrete example, for example, uh, G Gen Zero, which is a six to eight megapascal design mix, the embodied carbon is 0 0.034 kilograms of CO2 per kg of concrete if 70% GGBS is used as a substitute for cement. As a high embodied carbon a concrete example, we get a reinforced concrete uh, mixed design RC4050, so that's a design strength of 40 to 50 uh, MPA, with no cement, cement substitution, so we're using SIM1, uh, it is 0.172 kilograms of CO2 per kg of concrete. It's like the study on 34 houses in Canada, concrete accounts for 35.5% of the total material carbon emissions. Most of the emissions associated with this category come from the concrete itself. A small, almost negligible amount comes from the rebar, wire mesh and aggregate used in the homes. Due to its relative, due to its relative emissions impact, the rankings on the next slide focus exclusively on concrete mixes and address the question of emissions intensity. This figure here shows examples of different ready mix concrete uh, mix designs with different cementitious materials in them. So, for example, ready mix concrete uh, mix one there on the top, which has 0 to 14% fly ash or slag, and the rest generally is Portland cement, has the highest CO2 emissions with 327 kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter of concrete, which exceeds the Canadian benchmark value of 305. However, if we look at the ready mix concrete uh, number 19 here, which is between 35 and 50% slag and the balance of uh, Portland limestone cement, that has the lowest CO2 emissions with 214 kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter of concrete. This slide shows data from the inventory of carbon energy or ICE as it's known. You can see the different um, emissions associated with different types of cement, cementitious material with SIM1 or an important cement at 0.91 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kg of cement, all the way down to uh, SIM3C, uh, which is effectively has got a uh, slag in it. It has 88% uh, GGBS in it. That has uh, 0.15 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kg. On the left hand side, then you see the different concrete, the emissions associated with different concretes and kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kg. So, aerated concrete, for example, 0.48 kilograms of CO2e per kg, whereas uh, precast concrete, 0.15, uh, and general concrete, 0.11 kilograms of CO2e per kg. If you look at a simple case study building here, uh, which is a three-story office block location in Galway City. It's a reinforced concrete slab, a five uh, by five grid building, 
and a 7 meter by 5 meter bay. The mix design is a 30 MPa concrete and the reinforcement is 130 kilograms per cubic meter. So going to do a comparison here between two mix designs. The first mix that uses ordinary Portland cement or SIM1 and the second mix that uses SIM uh, 3A which is 50% GGBS. It's a cradle to site um, analysis and the findings here published quite a while ago but they were published in 2010 and you can see the reference there. So by using 50% GGBS uh, we saved 600 and 365 uh, gigajoules or 12.1% in terms of the embodied uh, energy. So that's equivalent of the energy used by about 19 average homes in Ireland in one year. And the savings in CO2 emissions is associated using, as, associate, as, as a result of 50% GGBS uh, was 93 tonnes or about 27.5%. And that's equivalent to taking 30 cars off the road for one year or the carbon is absorbed by um, 12 managed, 12 acres of managed iron forest for one year. So you can see just as a designer in terms of my specification, so the structural engineer in terms of my specification, just slightly changing my specification and still achieving the same strength requirements and the same uh, durability, if not improved durability, uh, I can have a significant saving in terms of embodied energy and body carbon uh, of my structure. There are many ways that we can reduce the embodied carbon of our uh, concrete structures. We've already talked a little bit here about low carbon uh, construction materials uh, in there, uh, and also about the circular economy and recycled using recycled concrete paste, for example, back into concrete. We can embed other waste products into the concrete. Um, there's also a methodology to inject the carbon dioxide into the fresh concrete, where it converts to a solid uh, mineral called calcium carbonate, and that's uh, called carbon cure. We should also optimise the material usage uh, as well, such as minimising the waste, uh, both on site uh, and in the factory. We should also use materials only where needed. So the example down there in the bottom is where the plastic, uh, recycled plastic balls are used to replace where concrete would traditionally be, where it's not really needed for structural strength. Now uh, we should design for manufacture, disassembly and reuse, so we can uh, disassemble at the end of our use uh, and uh, be able to reuse the components, structural components again. We should just carry out parametric modelling and optimise the use of materials in there uh, and also look at the durability of materials to make sure that we get an extended life and that the, build, the materials are going to last a long time so they don't have to be uh, replaced uh, too often. So steel. Well, 51% of global steel is used for construction according to the World Steel Association. Steel is used in many construction projects ranging from single dwellings to large scale infrastructure. In the US, the steel industry is responsible for 104.6 uh, MMT of CO2 emissions annually, making up 2% of the total uh, US emissions. Due to technological improvements and increased scrap steel recycling, the steel industry emissions have dropped largely by approximately 60% since 1990. Even so, steel is still a, a substantial source of embodied carbon emissions for the built environment that could theoretically be reduced to zero through material substitution or cleaner, or cleaner steel production. In recent decades, the steel industry in many countries has shifted away from the use of integrated steel mills and the primary use of blast oxygen furnaces towards the use of the more efficient electric arc furnaces, which is scrap steel as the primary input. For example, of all the US steel made in 2016, 70% was manufactured using the efficient electric arc furnaces, reflecting the switch that's indeed reduced the carbon footprint of steel. However, steel production remains an incredibly energy intensive product process. To highlight the variation in embodied emissions associated with steel, I'm taking the data out of the ICE, the Inventory for Carbon and Energy here. I can see that when we use steel for organic coated steel, the emissions are three, just over three kilograms of CO2 for every kg of steel that we produce. As so we look down at the engineering steel at the very bottom, it's all the way down to 1.27 kilograms of CO2 e per kg. So it's important to make sure that we're using the right values and uh, depends on the type of steel that we uh, employ within our project. Next, we look at the insulation. Insulation products are essential to create operationally efficient buildings. 
They can significantly contribute to a building's embodied uh, carbon budget, however. This category of materials has products with a broad range of embodied carbon impacts, from carbon intensive petrochemical based contributors to carbon negative options. In this figure, rigid or spray foam products like XBS, HFC, HFO, and EPS have the greatest associated emissions. In contrast, biological based materials such as cellulose, hempcrete, and straw bales can contribute very little to body carbon or even be considered net zero sequestering products. This figure shows the greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 equivalent of some rigid insulation boards. The XP XPS foam board has the highest CO2 emissions with 4,937 kilograms of CO2 per square meter. So that's every square meter of the XPS foam board is about five tons of carbon associated with it. That's about 17 times that for the EPS foam. However, the wood fibre board has the lowest embodied carbon with uh, minus 663 kilograms of CO2 uh, per square metre board. It's because it's considered a carbon sequestering product. For the wall cavity insulation materials, the aerogel blanket has the highest CO2 emissions with uh, 4,224 kgs of CO2 per meter squared, which is 27 times that for the fiberglass bat. Here we can see the straw bale has low CO2 emissions uh, with minus 1,957 kilograms of CO2 per square meter, because it's considered a carbon sequestering product. So effectively every square meter of straw bale uh, is absorbed about two uh, tons of carbon. Timber has been used in construction for thousands of years and is still one of the most widely used building materials. In 2017, building construction accounted for 62% of wood products in use in the US. In Ireland, um, we've now got a vast majority of our uh, homes are now being built using timber frame. Although conventionally used for single family houses and low rise buildings, wood attracts interest worldwide for taller buildings as wood products become an effective alternative to more carbon intensive concrete and steel. With the introduction of innovative design strategies and engineering wood products such as cross laminated timber, wood is steadily becoming a more viable material option for low and medium rise buildings. Cross laminated timber is a plate like engineered pro timber product which usually consists of an odd number of layers so like either three, five, seven or more which are stacked orthogonally to each other and bonded with structural adhesives or less commonly mechanically or na with nails or dowels. Cross laminated timber or CLT has become of global interest due to its numerous advantages over mineral based solid construction materials. The scope of application of CLT lies mainly in load bearing, non load bearing and reinforced components, so wall, roof and ceiling uh, elements. The CLT layers form independent depends on the capacity and design of the production line. In Europe, the most common layering systems are band conveyors or vacuum lifting devices. In plants with low capacity, CLT layups can also be done by human operators. Carbon sequestration can only be claimed for sustainably sourced timber to ensure that, that the trees felled are replaced with at least the same number of trees planted therefore not contributing to deforestation and the subsequent depletion of the overall carbon absorbing capacity of woodlands. Carbon sequestration can only be applied to timber that ends up in a product, not to excess timber that will become waste material, as this may be used as a biofuel and therefore the sequester carbon returns to the atmosphere. The figure shows the life cycle of timber and other materials which are extracted from forests and woods. Again, like other materials, the embodied carbon of timber varies depends on the, what type of timber we're using, whether it's uh, how engineered the wood is. The embodied carbon average of timber is 0.49 kilograms of CO2e per kg, excluding carbon sequestration, and minus 1.03 kilograms of CO2e per kg of timber, including carbon sequestration, as according to the ICE database. No, the timber could even be considered a net carbon sequester sequestering material because the carbon sequestered during a tree's growth can surpass the carbon emitted during the harvesting and manufacturing. However, 
This determination depends on the method of uh, cultivation and harvest, as well as the end of life considerations of the material. In order to fully understand the impact of timber materials, environmental assessments will first account for variation in forest management and harvesting practices, because difference in these practices produce great disparities in the amount of carbon sequestered. For example, the Forest Stewardship Council certifies that wood products are responsible and sustainable are produced, and specifying FSC certified products is a positive step towards managing low carbon wood products. As demand grows for wood products, it would be crucial to ensure that sustainable forest management practices meet this demand. Otherwise, the broader use of timber as a building product could result in a higher embodied carbon and less ecological diversity. It's popular for walls, facades, paving and some foundations. In the UK, red brick is the most trusted building material and, therefore, always attractive to the home buying market. Its production is the largest sector in the UK clay construction products market. Brick is produced by cutting a piece of clay into units, which are fired at around 2000 degrees Celsius. Emissions come from the fossil fuels used in the heating and the process related to clay manufacturing. On larger scale buildings, brick slips are usually used to save time and cost. Brick slips are mounted on steel fixing and used as a rain screen. This increases embodied carbon on a weight basis and sacrifices the thermal mass benefits. Embodied carbon in bricks is 0.213 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kg or 0.454 kilograms of CO2 E per standard brick weighing 2.13 kgs. The figure here shows the emissions of different types of bricks and kilograms of CO2 E per kg of brick. You can see the varies uh, from 0.31 kgs uh, all the way to 0.24 kgs of CO2 emissions per kg of brick. Two case studies were designed and constructed to have a very low environmental impact of construction and use. In the first case, the Wise building, the plinth walls that supported the timber frame were constructed using sand, lime, calcium silicate bricks. These are autoclaved, cured and pressurized steam which is much less energy than firing standard bricks. In the second case, resource rows, the facades are created from upcycling old buildings using three square meter cutout segments of old brick walls, complete with a mortar from three different buildings. So the lime glass accounts for 90% of all the manufactured glass. It's made of up to, it's made up of 70, 74% silica, along with sodium carbonate, lime, magnesium oxide, and aluminium oxide to enhance its performance. Glass furnaces run permanently during their lifetime for about 15 to 18 years, making introducing new technologies difficult. This can only be integrated during furnace replacement or upgrade. Again, with other construction materials, the embodied carbon can vary depends on the specification of the glass. You can see here, uh, using the data from the Inventory of Carbon and Energy, or the ICE database, that glass can vary from 3.10 um, kilograms of CO2 per kg of glass, all the way down to 1.44 uh, kilograms of CO2 emissions per kg of glass. The more processing involved in making glass, uh, the, the more the embodied carbon is going to increase. With unique translucent properties, glass is used for curtain walls, facades, windows, skylights, partitions, bulbs and tubes. Recycled glass can have a second use as insulation or aggregate. Glass requires using sand and minerals, which are non-renewable natural raw materials. Glass coating processes produce white solid waste and emit uh, VOCs or uh, volatile organic compounds. In some cases, double glazing can be more carbon efficient than triple glazing, as the carbon footprint derived from using a triple glaze system can be higher than that, than the operational carbon saving over the anticipated lifetime of the building. Timber is usually the best, although not the cheapest option when framing is required. Timber has a longer lifespan than uh, PVC, uh, and better thermal performance than steel or aluminium. Aluminium. The 
production of primary aluminium requires a very high consumption of electricity, almost 10 times that of steel. Due to, the energy, due to the energy intensive process, the embodied carbon is very high, especially if aluminium is used in large volumes. To reduce the embodied carbon as much as possible, electricity from renewable sources shall be used in the manufacture of aluminium. Therefore, if the use of aluminium is unavoidable, it should be specified from a country with large, with largely renewable energy uh, infrastructure, such as Norway or Iceland. By contrast, aluminium is highly recyclable with properties that do not deteriorate as the material is reused. Worldwide, around 75% of aluminium produced is still in use. Recycling uses only around 5% of the energy needed to produce primary aluminium. The recycled material supply chain is, however, not enough to cover the current demand. It is therefore imperative to reclaim as much aluminium as possible at the end of the life of the, each product. The embodied carbon of aluminium depends on where it was produced and the proportion of recycled material used. For example, if it was produced in Europe and assuming a recycled rate of 83% based on the worldwide flow model of the construction sector, 5.58 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kg of uh, 5.58 5 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kg of aluminium produced. In general, mix in Europe including imports and assuming a recycle rate of 95%, then that goes up to 6.67 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kg. As a result of its high em environmental impact, aluminium should be treated as a high value material and used sparingly with reuse in mind. Coating should be avoided when unnecessary. Environmental product declaration coating should be used where possible. And again, we show the emissions associated with aluminium, uh, which are taken from the ICE database, Inventory of Carbon and Energy. The figures show the emissions of different aluminium products for general aluminium mix in Europe, including imports and assuming a recycle rate of 95%. The emissions equate to 6.67 kilograms of CO2 emissions per kg. If we look at aluminium foil at the very top um, from the European mix, which includes imports, uh, the emissions could increase to 7.47 kilograms of CO2 um, equivalent per kg of aluminium produced. You can see here that aluminium has the highest carbon emissions if compared with other cladding materials such as fibre cement, steel panels, lime plaster, vinyl and wood.